Greetings, ladies and gentlemen. I'm the Professor Junichiro Swanson. And you are now watching the video lecture called The What and Why of Functional Programming Languages, in which I seek to answer two questions. The first being, what is functional programming, really? And the other question being the only question that might come to your mind after learning the answer to that first question, which is, why the hell would you do that? Whoa, I'm back. Introduction. Let's talk about functional programming. I've looked up a bunch of videos that try to introduce functional programming. I think the one you're watching now is different from all the other ones, and I think it's better too. Congratulations on finding it. The primary design of this video is barely do justice to the two questions, what is functional programming and why does it matter? The word barely in that definition means if I were any briefer then I wouldn't be doing the justice, but this presentation isn't too long to do just that. And we will, before the end of the video, be covering many of the most important advantages and disadvantages of functional programming. This is not a speech which is going to slag all of the other programming paradigms. I am not a functional programming supremacist. I'm a functional programming nationalist, which is totally a different thing. There are domains where functional programming reigns supreme, and there are domains where it does not. Functional programming is now a substantial portion of the programming that's being done in the world, so this is very important business, and you'd better pay attention. The target audience for this video is everyone. It should be most useful to people who have learned the basics of programming in the context of one or two programming languages which are not functional programming. However, it should make sense even if you have no background, and it should be useful even if you have a lot of background because, as some people say, when you learn functional programming then you lose the ability to explain it. Har har har. So maybe someone's a functional programming weirdo and someone else can't seem to figure out what's the draw. Well, hopefully I can do a good explainer here and just teach everybody why functional programming isn't only a weird person thing, it's also a good thing. Copyright notice, schools may not use this, some but not all rights reserved. Let's preview some of the topics. What is functional programming? Functional programming, which is done using functional programming languages, is a type of programming where everything is functions. Kind of. More details to come. Why do functional programming? Functional programming, once you know how to do it, is the best method for many but not all programming tasks. Some further answers to why do functional programming? 1. Functional programming is a type of job. There are jobs for which they only hire functional programmers. If you learn it, then you can get those jobs, otherwise not. Diversify your portfolio of employable skills, bro. 2. Learning is good. Functional programming requires you to wrestle your brain into shapes it's never taken before, and that leaves it with the plasticity to learn a greater variety of things you might encounter. Some people also find that fun. If you learn functional programming, it will make the math and logic parts of your brain very buff. Speaking of which, I'm no paragon of mental health. Maybe functional programming will make you terribly isolated and alienated from the rest of the world and wreak havoc on your mental health, causing mental illness. I don't know. Count on both. 3. This is one you might not have anticipated, but it's possibly the biggest gem. It's the small programming tasks that make up daily drudgery. Like when you have to make some program talk to some other program, and this one gives outputs in plain text, and this one takes inputs in plain text, and your job is to make the program that takes this thing and gets the information and changes the punctuation to what this program reads. You have one of those miscellaneous tasks, it's some program that's only going to be used on the day you make it for a few seconds. Nobody's going to care what language you use, it's something that's going to take half an hour to create in either of two of the languages you know, and if one of those is functional programming, you're thinking, well, I can do this in one of two ways. There's the way that's inherently pleasant, or at the very least not too unpleasant, or I can do this the other way, the one about which the same can't be said. Yeah, I'm going with functional for this one. For all the times that an office worker has said to himself, Damn, that guy's chair looks really uncomfortable. Good thing I have this better one which is much more comfortable. Or at the very least, less uncomfortable. There's a functional programmer who said, Wow, I sure am glad that I loaded that knowledge of how to use functional programming into my brain. My life would be 15% more annoying if I hadn't. It's also the programming paradigm which more closely resembles how a brain works. You'll have a greater sense of humanity, or at the very least, less of a sense of inhumanity while at your job. By the way, there are footnotes on screen at the end. Alright, introduction's over. Here's a program. What language is this in, huh? There's a bunch of languages that this could be. We're starting by showing how similar imperative and functional programming can appear for a trivially simple program. Actually, I took this piece of writing in Notepad and I saved it by two names, one with an extension .m and one with an extension .hs. Identical documents, just different extensions in the file names. In this example, we're using two programming languages, MATLAB and Haskell. My three favorite programming languages are those two and TI-83 Basic. 
On this computer, MATLAB the language is run by MATLAB the programming environment, which is associated with .m files. Haskell the language is run by GHCI the programming environment, which is associated with .hs files on this computer. When I double click on the .m copy of this program, it loads in MATLAB and then I click on the go button in the editor and the console shows us that the program worked. When I double click on the .hs copy of the program, it loads in GHCI. It only shows the loading messages, but since it gave us an input prompt and no error messages, that means that it ran without errors. Then we can query it for the values of A, B, and C, and the results are as expected. So right now, both languages are seeming pretty similar, but there's already some differences. In MATLAB, which we're using as an imperative language in this example, the equal sign means compute what's to the right of the equal sign and assign it to a variable with the name of what's to the left of the equal sign. Saying a equals 1 plus 1 causes the computer to compute 1 plus 1, which is equal to 2, and then assigns that value of 2 to the variable named a. In Haskell, which we're using as a functional language in this example, the equal sign means we define a constant with the name of whatever's to the left of the equal sign, and that constant is equal to the stuff to the right of the equal sign in the sense that you could just copy-paste what's to the right of the equal sign in place of wherever the name to the left of the equal sign appears elsewhere. A equals 1 plus 1 really is a statement of equality in this language, much like how the word equals or the equal sign works in human languages. When we double-clicked on the .hs file and it opened in GHCI, it checked for syntax errors and it didn't report any because it didn't find any. For the line a equals 1 plus 1, the syntax checker confirms that the name to the left of the equal sign is a valid name, then looks at the right side, sees the one operator, the plus sign, sees that there are numbers on both sides of the plus sign, then says nothing because all that syntax is fine. But at this time, the value of 1 plus 1 was entirely a mystery even though the program had loaded. It was when I queried it for the values of a, b, and c when it actually did the calculation of 1 plus 1 equals 2. Now to the simplest way of defining the difference between functional and imperative programming. In imperative programming, a program tells the computer what to do. In functional programming, a program tells the computer what things are. Imperative, do this. Functional, this is this. That's the simplest way to state the difference, but we'll be ending today with a better understanding than that. Analogy time. Let's say you're trying to explain to your friend what an orange peanut is, and all the peanuts he's ever seen were brown. An explanation that corresponds to imperative programming would be that brown peanut that you have, paint it orange. That's what an orange peanut is. An explanation that corresponds to functional programming would be that brown peanut that you have, if you had another peanut that's just like it in every way except that it's orange, that's what an orange peanut is. In the functional style, the only verbs that you used are to be and to have and the conjugations of those. Those are verbs that you use when defining things. In the imperative style, you use the verb paint when commanding your friend to apply paint. Imperative, do this. Functional, this is this. Alright, let's talk about these programming paradigm things. I've started making distinctions between functional programming and imperative programming. Those are programming paradigms. Different programming paradigms give you different ways of thinking about how to get computers to do the things you want them to do. Procedural programming is a subset of imperative programming. Most imperative programming languages are procedural. If you look up lists of popular imperative languages and popular procedural languages, the list will be almost identical. Functional programming is actually a subset of declarative programming. We won't be talking about other declarative paradigms today, but now we've drawn these two very encompassing sets, imperative and declarative, and those two words are also words used to describe human language sentences. In human languages, speaking an imperative sentence means commanding someone to do something, and speaking a declarative sentence means stating something like a fact. There are other programming paradigms, but that's also not in the scope of this talk. We will be making many distinctions between functional versus imperative programming or functional versus procedural programming. In most of those cases, the word imperative could be substituted for procedural and vice versa. Procedural programming specifically refers to imperative programming with subroutines. Since our MATLAB program from earlier didn't have any subroutines, you could say that that program was imperative but not procedural. The reason why most imperative programs are procedural, meaning having subroutines, is because having subroutines is an incredibly useful abstraction. Most imperative programs are better off with subroutines than without them. So what are subroutines? They're like functions, functions from functional programming, only subroutines are still written in terms of imperative instructions. Let's have a look at our two programming languages again. Here we have two .m files. One called factorial defines the subroutine called factorial. Well, subroutines in MATLAB are called functions, but they're really subroutines. The other .m file called main is a program which has just one line, and it asks for the factorial of 5. So the two files are main and factorial, and main is the program which calls the subroutine factorial. 
Let's look at our definition of factorial. The first line says that this is the definition of a function called factorial, and we'll call the result result and the input input. When you call this function, you give it an input and it gives you back a result. The next line says that the variable accumulator will start with a value of 1, then we have a for loop, which mutates the value of accumulator, and the last line says that the final return value is equal to whatever the value of accumulator is after the for loop is done mutating it. Within the for loop, we declare an index value called index, which takes on a series of values starting at 1 and ending at whatever was the input number that was used when calling the function. Each time the loop executes, the value of index is updated, and the value of accumulator is multiplied by the value of index, and that product becomes the new value of accumulator. It's not the most beautiful piece of poetry ever written in a programming language. Let's step through it quickly. In case you forgot, the factorial of a positive whole number is equal to the product of all the integers from 1 to that number. So the factorial of 5 is equal to 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. We ask for the factorial of 5. Input is 5. Next line makes the accumulator 1, then the for loop starts. Index will take all the values from 1 to 5 in sequence. First, actually, let's fast forward through part of this, and now the loop is run for the second to last time, incrementing index to 4, and accumulator times index is 6 times 4, which is 24, and 24 becomes the new value of accumulator. In the final pass through the loop, index is incremented to 5, accumulator times index is 24 times 5, which is 120, which becomes the final value of accumulator. Then the loop is done, and that value of 120 is returned as the result of the function. When we run the main program, it calls the function factorial with an input of 5, and the program gets back the right answer of 120. Indeed, 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1 is 120, and we've confirmed that the program works. Now, Haskell. Here's the program which defines the factorial function and calls it. The first line says that x is the factorial of 5, just like in the MATLAB program, and the other two lines define factorial in a completely different way than the for loop in procedural. All the definition for factorial says is that the factorial of 0 is 1, and that the factorial of any other number is the product of that number and the factorial of the next smaller number. Note that the factorial function calls itself. That's recursion. It's also much more expressive than our procedural implementation of factorial. This reads almost like English. If you showed me this out of context, like when I'm eating lunch or something, I might look at those two lines of writing and say, yeah, that's the definition of factorial, without realizing that it's even a computer program. Expressivity means that you can look at a program and know what it does. That's definitely a good thing that makes work easier than not having expressivity. Haskell programs can look more like specifications for programs than like actual programs. A specification for a program is a description of how a program works, but not in enough detail to run on a computer. There's stories where a guy will write a program in Haskell and then the boss will say, You wrote the specification for a program? Now write the program! And then the programmer guy says, That's not a specification for a program, that's the program, it runs! Expressivity is more often than not an emergent property and a major advantage of, surprise, the functional programming paradigm. Let's actually step through this. x equals the factorial of 5. Let's replace factorial of 5 with what it equates to. Factorial of 5 is 5 times the factorial of 4. Now we have x is 5 times the factorial of 4. Now let's replace factorial of 4 with what it equates to. Factorial of 4 is 4 times the factorial of 3. Now we have x is 5 times 4 times the factorial of 3. Factorial of 3 is 3 times the factorial of 2. Factorial of 2 is 2 times the factorial of 1. Factorial of 1 is 1 times the factorial of 0. And the factorial of 0 is 1. Now we have x equals 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1 times 1. And we can compute that, and it's 120. Okay, now we've seen two very different ways of defining the factorial function or subroutine. When I was talking about the MATLAB program, I used the word mutate not only for its negative connotation, but also because the Haskell program doesn't mutate the values of any variables. This is one of the main features of functional programming. There are no variables. There are constants which are like variables, only you can't change them. That's called immutability. Im meaning not. Mute meaning change. Ability meaning ability. Immutability, not being able to change things. In this expansion of factorial 5 working out to this product, all of the steps were simply the act of replacing something with its equivalent. In the procedural program, we used the variables index and accumulator, both of which had to change value many times in between calling the function and getting the result. So functional programming is awesome because it doesn't give you the ability to do things which other languages do. Actually, we'll be talking about advantages and disadvantages nearer to the end of this video, but to foreshadow, it's a good thing, trust me. Immutability, though. Returning very briefly to the example of what does a equals 1 plus 1 mean in the functional and procedural paradigms, recall that I said that in functional programming, the equal sign works much more like how it works in ordinary human language.
If you make a program in Haskell which has the line a equals 1 plus 1, and then other lines which refer to a, by consequence of this immutability thing, you could replace all instances of a in that program with its definition 1 plus 1. Imperative programming doesn't share this feature. Returning to the example of the factorial function defined procedurally, look at this line, it says that accumulator equals 1. Now look at this line, it says that accumulator equals accumulator times index. In the imperative paradigm, you can say that a thing equals something and then say elsewhere that the same thing equals something else. That's a consequence of mutability. To people who are fans of functional programming, this thought has a very dirty feel to it. How can you say that this thing equals this here and then say that it equals some other thing there? Are you a liar? Because the imperative paradigm is based on variables changing, thinking in the paradigm is also based on thinking about variables changing. Since the purely functional parts of functional programming are based on nothing being variable, thinking about how to program in that paradigm is based on thinking about objects as being defined in terms of relations to other objects. Note that in most procedural programming languages you can define factorial using a recursion and make it simpler than this mess. So let me note that I don't mean to make a straw man of the procedural paradigm in this section. The preceding illustration was comparing aspects of a possible recursive function for factorial and a possible imperative style procedure for factorial. Actually, the fact that you can make that function in either of those two ways in a procedural language, but can only make it in one of the ways in functional programming, first appears to be a disadvantage of functional programming and an advantage to procedural programming. Right now we're still just starting to define the differences between the paradigms, and this is that limitation or constraint stuff that defines functional programming, but I haven't yet illustrated how the constraints lead to any advantages. Alright, quick miscellaneous section now when we look at a few elementary programming things and how they differ in the paradigms we're comparing. x equals x plus 1. If you have learned the basics of programming from one or two imperative languages and never learned functional programming, then this utterance x equals x plus 1 probably doesn't evoke any sense of strangeness when you see it. From our earlier definition of the equal sign in the imperative paradigm, x equals x plus 1 means take the current value of x, add 1 to it, and assign that sum as the new value of x. This is also known as increment x, also written as x plus plus for short in some languages. But look at it x equals x plus 1. Suppose we're sitting in a math class and you see the equation x equals x plus 1 written on a piece of paper. You would have to say, there's no way to satisfy this equation for any value of x that's a real number. It's a perfectly concise contradiction. Now we're thinking of the equal sign as defining the value of a thing in an immutable way, much like the way that x and y and equals do when you're manipulating equations when doing math. Next miscellaneous thing, loops. For loops and while loops do exist in imperative languages, don't exist in functional languages. Why? That whole immutability versus mutability thing. Every for loop needs to have an index variable which needs to be mutable. We called this index variable index in our earlier example. In a similar way, every while loop needs to have a mutable boolean value to be the condition of when the loop ends. Thus, no for loops or while loops in functional programming. Actually, you can hackishly use for loops and while loops in a language like Haskell if you want, but that's a very silly thing to do because, well, visual analogy time. The reason why it's pointless is because functional programming gives you certain advantages, and you get the advantages by limiting the ways you reason about things. One of those limits is getting rid of mutability. The result of that limit is that for loops and while loops are not ways of thinking which are compatible with the way that we do reasoning in this paradigm. So hackishly using for loops and while loops cause you to think about the programming in ways that are not what the functional paradigm is for, and that negates the advantages of the paradigm, and that's why it's silly to do those things. Next miscellaneous thing, if-thens, also known as conditionals, have a guess? If-thens do exist in both imperative and functional styles. Like the equal sign, the meaning of an if-then does vary slightly across paradigms. In the imperative paradigm, if-thens are conditional instructions, and in the functional paradigm, if-thens are conditional functions. In imperative you have if condition, then command, and you can optionally have else some other command. If the condition is true, then the one command runs, and if the condition is false, then the other command runs, or the line does nothing if the condition is false and there's no else. 
in the functional style if then else is a conditional function and always has the else part and the function returns one of two values. It takes the form of if condition then value one else value two. So the conditional instruction in the imperative style might say if today is a Thursday then command the robot to pick up the dry cleaning else command the robot to make dessert whereas the conditional function in the functional style might say if input number is greater than a million then this if then else thing evaluates to the string that's a big number else this if then else thing evaluates to the string that's a small number. Next miscellaneous thing infinite data structures this line take five of the repeat of f it evaluates to five f's and the take function just takes some number of elements from a list so what is repeat f it's an infinitely long list of f's you can ask for it and the computer will keep going and giving as much of the thing as it can do until you do an interrupt take five of this gives you a list of the numbers one through five so what is this one dot dot in square brackets it's all the counting numbers you can name a constant which is equal to one of these infinite data structures, and that isn't a problem for the program, because when you load the program, the interpreter just looks at the syntax and says, well, there's no syntax error there. If you want to name that thing to mean that value, then those things shall be synonymous in the sense that I could just copy-paste in that definition for wherever that name appears elsewhere in the program. And the fact that the value goes on forever doesn't conflict with any of that interpreting of the program. Infinite data structures make a variety of programming tasks easier, and infinite data structures are a result of lazy evaluation, and lazy evaluation is a feature that you'll find almost exclusively in the functional languages because it isn't really compatible with the imperative paradigm, thus that's another big advantage of functional programming. Alright, final miscellaneous thing before the next section. What else can functions do? Composition, take the successor and square functions. Successor just means one more than, like how 7 is the successor of 6. You can have the successor of the square of a number, or the square of the successor of a number, or the square of the square of a number, etc. That's function composition. Another thing, functions can take one input and give multiple outputs, or take multiple inputs and give one output. You can have a function which takes three inputs and gives two outputs. Actually, there's an under-the-hood thing called currying based on the lambda calculus, which breaks functions down into smaller functions, each of which takes a single input but can output a function, but that's spooky logic stuff that takes place under a hood that we usually don't regard when we're programming, such as when we say you can have a function which takes three inputs and gives two outputs. Another thing, functions can have helper functions which break down your work into easily digestible pieces. That really just means defining some functions and limiting their scope, and it makes your code more tidy. In this case, the function foo has a helper function called bar. This says the foo of x is 1 plus the bar of x, where the bar of x is x times 2. Say we call foo with 5, so all these x's on both lines are 5's. This now reads, the foo of 5 is 1 plus the bar of 5, where the bar of 5 is 5 times 2. 5 times 2 is 10, so the bar of 5 is 10. And the foo of 5 is 1 plus the bar of 5, so 1 plus 10, which is 11. And indeed, when we ask GHCI for the foo of 5, it says 11. All right, enough miscellaneous stuff. Back to the uh, electrolinguistics. At this time, we continue to compare paradigms based on the grammar of ordinary human languages. Because remember, programming languages are human languages too. Compilers and interpreters are programs that turn programming language into computer language. Of these three things, English, your favorite programming language, and machine code, all these languages are human languages, and comparing them on their own terms is a very useful investigation in understanding programming languages. When you're writing programs, you're using nouns and adjectives and verbs and stuff for the names of your constants and functions and things, so trust me, this stuff does bear the amount of explaining that I'm giving it. Recall the orange peanut example? Doesn't matter if you forgot it, now let's expand on the idea. Okay, very simple MATLAB program. It says that A is the list 4862, then add a 5 to the start of A and that's the new A, then sort A, and then that's the new A, then take the last element off A, and then that's the new A. This is in the imperative style. When you describe it in human language, you use the verbs add to the start of, sort, and remove the last element of. When we run it, the console shows us the initial, intermediate, and final states of the list A as we start with this, add a number to the start, sort, and then remove the last element. We can just as easily introduce a new name in each of these lines, and now we have four lists, one for each of those states. Now it's not one list going through a series of changes. In this form with the four separate names, there's no mutation, and now we can have the same program in Haskell. At the top of the program it says import data list. That's just something you have to say in order to get the sort function available. When we run the program and ask for the values of A, B, C, and D, we get the same outputs as the MATLAB version. 
The two programs still look identical, aside from the two languages having slight differences in function names and punctuation. But let's see how we can interpret this in a way that doesn't use action verbs. Again, bearing with me on why this would matter. Okay, no action verbs. Ready? A is the list 4862. B is a list which is just like A in every way except having a 5 at the start of it. C is a list which is just like B in every way except being in ascending order. And D is a list which is just like C except for not having the last entry. That read has nouns, adjectives, the verbs to be and to have, and their conjugations, but no action verbs, just like the orange peanut example. The way that this program is written, C equals sort B, that's an action verb, sorting something. Does that mean that this program written like this is one of those things that you can do in the functional style but shouldn't do because it's incongruent with the paradigm? No, actually. The thought processes in functional programming do include mutation. They do include things happening to things. What does it mean, then, that functional programming has immutability? Let's draw a very loose definition of the paradigm and say that functional programs all have a characteristic that they can be interpreted into English in ways such that no action verbs are present. Action verbs refer to actions, which are things that take place over time, and mutation means things changing over time. So that's the connection between action verbs and mutability, between lack of action verbs and immutability. However, that loose definition doesn't say that you somehow need to use a system of thought processes whereby you're never imagining anything changing. That's not part of functional programming involving wrestling your brain into shapes it's never taken before. Here's an alternate version of this program. This version says that sorted equals sort. That means we define a function called sorted and that function is just the same thing as sort. Now C equals sorted B, that's noun, the verb to be, adjective, other noun. And we could also define sorted functionally and get rid of the verb sort. No action verbs left. That confirms the loose definition that you can get rid of all the action verbs, to say nothing of whether or not it's the best way to think about the program you're writing in the privacy of your own brain and other documentation. For the line C equals sort B, you can think of the list B and think B got sorted, and you can imagine a bunch of little pieces of paper with numbers on them and a pair of hands rearranging them until they're in ascending order. That's not violating what you have to do in order to work in the functional paradigm. You do have to remember to call the thing by separate names for before and after some action's been done to it. B got sorted, then it was called C after getting sorted. Totally not cheating. And even though we're still looking at a trivially simple example program, the illustration still holds for programs in general in these two paradigms. I'm not making any prescriptions on what not to call anything within a program. In both paradigms, functions or subroutines usually have verbs for names, but adjectives or prepositions can also be names for functions or subroutines. Variables or constants usually have nouns for names, but can also be adjective noun. Use whatever word types you want. Let's try our loose definition thing on our two implementations of factorial. Can we take the functional program and translate it into English in a way that has no action verbs? I already did. The factorial of 0 is 1, and that the factorial of any other number is the product of that number and the factorial of the next smaller number. The only verb there is is, which is a conjugation of to be. What if we were to try this no action verbs translation on our procedural factorial subroutine? It takes a struggle to take this program and translate it into English in such a way that the only verbs you use are to be and to have, so our loose definition holds loosely. A few last things to say about the ABCD program. We can do that function composition thing and call all three functions in one line to get the same resulting list D. And here's what it looks like with helper functions. This gets us the same result, but now this another D is defined in terms of Z, and Z is a helper function, and Z is defined in terms of Y. Y is a helper function of Z. So this line has a helper function which has a helper function. That's a nesting structure. In this example, y is the same thing as b above, and z is the same thing as c above, but because these are helper functions, these names aren't available to be referred to outside of this where block. If you try to call z or y from outside of this definition, you get an error. Now let's look at some more things which are not violations of immutability. When you use a helper function, you define a name in a limited scope. You can then use the same name to define a completely different helper function in a different limited scope. In this program, this function has a helper function that says that foo equals 1, and this other function has a helper function that says that foo equals 2. A constant, by the way, is just a type of function that takes no inputs and gives one output. This program does run, but there's a name in there that means multiple different things. Well, any time that you have something like this, the names will be in different scopes that don't overlap. So any time that you have something like this, you could just rename one of them to something else, and now you don't have multiple definitions for the same name. Or anytime you see this double naming thing, you can just say, uh, the scopes are different, so that double naming is actually just shorthand for not double naming. Totally not cheating.
Think of it like this. You did some math homework on Monday, and you used the names X and Y to help you get to some answer. Then you did some more math homework on Tuesday, and you used the names X and Y to help you get the answer to some completely different thing. If you had to do a year of math homework without reusing names in different scopes, then you would need a lot of names, so it's okay to use the same name to mean completely different things in different scopes, as long as those separate scopes are clearly delineated. Another thing that's not a violation of immutability, calling a function and then calling it again with a different input. When I call factorial with an input of 5, it's 120, but when I call it with 6, then it's 720. Does that mean that factorial mutates? No, the definition of factorial is the same in both cases, so the function itself is not mutating. If I say that my mouse is to the right of my keyboard and my coffee mug is to the right of my computer screen, that doesn't mean that the definition of to the right of changed in the time that I said that. Hey, did anyone notice a parallel between the distinction between these two programming paradigms and two of the pre-Socratic philosophers? Well, neither did a Google search, so we're going there. Pre-Socratic philosophy means philosophy from before Socrates. The reason it's categorized that way is because most of philosophy happened after Socrates, but there were a few other philosophers in the few centuries before him around that part of the world. There was Thales, who said that all the world is water, Heraclitus, who said that all the world is fire, and other people who said other things about the four elements. By now we have a lot more elements with names like Einsteinium and Tin. Hopefully 126 someday soon. But back then they were writing about earth, air, fire, and water, and they were saying things more scientific sounding than other writings from the time, like mythology. And for all those guys lacked in particle colliders, they were great at saying things which feel like they're true. Assertions which have a great deal of truthiness, if not actual truth. Belly feel. We look at just the metaphysics of two of these guys, Heraclitus and Anaximander, today. Heraclitus is the guy who said that fire is primary, and he meant that everything is always changing, since change is the spirit of fire. If there's something which can be said of everything, it's that everything is in the process of changing from one thing to another. You can get a sense of unity in a statement like that, but it's strictly in a cheeky sort of way. You can't step into the same river twice is accredited to him. Heraclitus might point out that your computer has likely never been in exactly the same state twice, even with state just defined as the states of all the binary digits and zeros and ones, or that every program written in the imperative paradigm consists entirely of lines that are lists of instructions for changing things, and lines that help organize lists of instructions for changing things. Anaximander is the guy who said that all four elements are in balance, and his jam was to say, Technically, there is no change. If you take the state of all things right now, and like the state all things were in yesterday, and like the state all things will be in tomorrow, and like likewise for all the times, and call that whole thing the world, then like that the world encapsulates all the times, past, present, and future, and then that the world is then a changeless thing. Anaximander wants to give us an extra temporality, whereas functional programming makes a space of a temporality, so there's a slight mismatch there, but they're both saying, hey, there's a framework of concepts that you can use to get free of that time dimension that most other people think is necessary. To make a definite statement about the way the pre-Socratic philosophers relate to the programming paradigms, if I were the boss of HR at some company, and there's two jobs that need filling, and the goo back in charge of hiring brings me two new recruits who just got out of a time machine from 400 BC, and on their ancient historical personality tests, from back when those had questions about Heraclitus and Anaximander instead of Myers and Briggs, one of them had indicated strongly agree for fire is primary and change pervades everything, and the other one had indicated strongly agree for time can be encompassed into a thing unchanging, then I would say, all right, Heraclitus guy, world is fire and changes what everything has in common. There's a bunch of stuff that we need solved with procedural programming. Here's a pile of books that will make your procedural programmer read the stuff, make the stuff, bring us results. An Aximander guy, abstractions can subvert time and change needing to exist. There's a bunch of stuff that we need solved with functional programming. Here's a pile of books that will make you a functional programmer. Read the stuff, make the stuff, bring us results. And definitely not the other way around. The reason why I thought all this stuff was worth mentioning? Well, when you say to someone, hey, try this functional programming thing, everything's a function and nothing's mutable, what? What if we did that? Isn't that limiting? Yeah, but advantages, trust me. And then you can lead them somehow to convincing, <clears throat> link them to this video maybe? You are invoking an ethos which has been continuous among us Earth humans for more than 2,000 years now, since the start of recorded history.
Among the things that aren't covered in this lesson are the rest of the history of functional programming from circa 4th century BC to ongoing, but there is a lot of interesting stuff there. Do check that out if that sounds interesting to you. Time for an interlude. Get your ass moving, Nick. Get your oh, ass Virgil moving, Nick. Watching. Get Virgil, your what's ass up, moving, brother? Nick. Get oh, your Virgil ass moving, Nick. Watching. Get your ass, get your ass, get your, get your, get your ass, get your ass, get your ass, get your, get your, get your ass, get your, get your, get your ass, get your, get your ass moving, get your, get your, get your ass, get your, get your ass moving, get your, get your, get your ass, get your, get your ass moving, get your, get your, get your ass, 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 get your, get your, get your ass, get your ass, get your Ass, get your, get your, get oh, your ass, move, get song. your ass, get your ass, get your, get your, get your ass, this song get your, is get awesome. your, get your ass, I'm get your it. ass, move and make. Thus begins the second act. Everything before this was the first. All the programs we've seen so far were trivially simple, it's time to look at a program that's not immensely complicated, but more detailed than we could cover in full here, and we'll cover it partially. And after that, there are many explanations that relate back to this program. It's a ray tracer program. When you run it, it generates a picture of what some object in a virtual space would look like. This particular ray tracer does space that's voxelized, meaning like Minecraft. The output picture is written in this file format, where there's just a couple of lines at the top to define the format and stuff, and then the rest is all RGB values for the pixels, one after another. These RGB values are all between 0 and 255, and each set of three numbers there corresponds to the amount of red, green, and blue light combining to make the color for a pixel. This is the .ppm picture format, it's a raw image format, meaning it's not compressed, meaning there are other ways of defining the same picture which take up less hard drive space. The advantage of the ppm format is that it's easy to write ppms from a program, like the program we're analyzing. Here I give a quick explanation of how this works, and that explanation won't be limited to lacking action verbs. This virtual space has a number of cubes in it. We call the cubes blocks, and together we call the group of all blocks the plot. Your plot could be anything you might plot in Minecraft, such as your house, the ship from Star Trek, or this pattern thing called a voxelized Sierpinski octahedron. In addition to the plot, the user's location and the user's computer monitor are also imagined to be in this virtual space. The computer monitor in the virtual space is a flat rectangle with an array of pixels that correspond with the pixels of the resultant picture that we're trying to compute. For each pixel we need to compute, we imagine a beam shooting out of the viewer's eye in a direction which makes the beam pass through a particular pixel of the computer monitor in the virtual space. In the program, I call these eye beams because my academic background is actually mechanical engineering, but normally you'd call these rays. Each of these beams possibly hits a block, or more than one block, or a beam can miss all the blocks. When the program is running, most of the computation is each of the beams querying each face of each block, and then doing some math to figure out whether there's a hit. For any beam which doesn't hit any faces of any blocks, there's some function which takes the beam's direction numbers and computes a pixel of this earthbound style background pattern. For any beam which hits one or more block faces, it finds, for each collision, how far did this beam travel when it hit this block face. If a beam has collisions with more than one block face, then it wants to find out which of those happened first, because that corresponds with whichever block face was in front of all the other ones that the beam collided with, front meaning closest to the viewer. Once the beam figures out which was the first of its collisions, then it tells us a color for the pixel showing that block. The colors of the blocks are determined such that their coordinates x, y, z in this space just intersect with RGB space. So one pole of this octahedron is red, one's green, one's blue, those three are mutually perpendicular, and the opposite poles of those are the secondary colors of RGB, cyan, magenta, and yellow. And any beam whose first collision is near the edge of a block face gets its color darkened by a darkening function, and that gives us the outlines between the blocks. We'll be looking at this program in a few forms. There's this ordinary human-readable version, then there's two other versions where I've done weird things with the code. In this one, most of the functions are written at this zero level of indentation. When you write a function there with no indentation, that means that it can be referred to anywhere else in the program, and we say that it's in the global name space. And most of these functions have type declarations. A type declaration is where you say what data types a function takes as inputs and gives as outputs. Here's that function that takes numbers and returns words. In this program, it doesn't have a type declaration. In this case, a type declaration is optional. When you run this code, the types can be inferred. The compiler can deduce from the code when you write this that it's a function that takes numbers and gives words. You can even write this line of code and ask GHCI for the types, and it will give you a type declaration. This one says that it takes any number type and returns a string. 
We can take this same line and put it in the code, and the code runs the same, so what's the point? There are a few reasons why type declarations are useful. One reason is that it makes the code more expressive. If you include many type declarations, it will make the code much easier to understand for human readers. Another reason for these is that if you declare the wrong types, the compiler will tell you to fix it before it will compile. That's very useful when building programs. The type declarations are a way to get the compiler to help you. This is also known as holding hands with GHCI as you build the program together. Another reason for type declarations is that they are sometimes necessary where the types can't be inferred automatically. And another reason for type declarations is that you can restrict the types that a function will use. For example, this function takes any number type and returns words, but you can restrict it to take integers only. Restricting which types a function can take can be useful for preventing unintended use, such as when you have two data types and the function only makes sense when applied to one and not the other. Anyways, this is the ray tracer in the human readable form with most of the functions in the global namespace and with type declarations. This is an equivalent program in a different form. This is the top half and this is the bottom half, and I separated them and put them side by side to make it fit on the screen better. These two lines are things that wrapped around, meaning they would be up on these two lines if I were using a wider picture. This program also outputs the same picture in the PPM format when it's run. There's no practical reason to do this to a program other than as an act of tinkering. What I did to turn that program into this form is to use many levels of where blocks in order to limit each function to the scope of which functions use it, then I broke down each function into as many small parts as possible without any being redundant. Then I abstracted out all the names and replaced them with generic names three characters long. Now this program is this list of definitions to match the names to the values in the prelude functions, and one main line called main and the rest is a giant where block of main made of successively smaller where blocks. There's eight levels of where block nesting, which means that these guys are helpers of a helper 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 of main. And if you acquire a level of fluency in Haskell, you'll be able to see that this whole program is broken into tiny, simple working pieces, and there's a sort of profound feeling when you look at the code in this form and then the complexity of the output. But this absolutely isn't readable in any practical sense. I deliberately included bugs in both forms of the program, and you might find it easier to bug fix the human readable form than to try to modify the program in this form. This function here called write file is unique in that it's the only I.O. operation in this whole program. I.O. being short for input-output. More about I.O. soon. Write file is an operation which makes a file as the output of the program. For a program that has only one I.O. operation, main is the line that calls it directly. Okay, that's enough of the woe dude version of this program. Let's learn some of the actual fundamentals of functional programming, starting with two functions that are so fundamental that they're single special characters in Haskell, the dots and the dollar signs. Dots and dollar signs are usually just used to help clean up grammar. The dot symbol is function composition, and the dollar sign is function application. Here's a composition of six functions. It asks for the square of the successor of the square of the successor of the square of the successor of one, and that requires five levels of nesting parentheses. A cleaner way to write this is by putting the six functions into one pair of parentheses and then separating them with dots. These lines both mean the same thing, and this one is also read the square of the successor of the square of the successor of the square of the successor of one. As for the dollar sign, here's a concept that's only slightly tricky. What if I told you that function application is a function what and why? Let's say we have a function called do nothing, and it takes one input and it gives one output, and the output is always identical to the input. That's an identity function. I can say that a equals 5, b equals the do nothing of 5, and c equals the do nothing of the do nothing of 5, and then they all equal 5. So the identity function makes sense as a thing that does what it does, but we would need some convincing if anyone said that it gives us any abilities. A function application now. Similar in the sense that it appears at first to do nothing that we can't do without it. If we give the function application function, the square function, and the number 5, it will return 25. On the one hand, I can just call the square function with 5 and get 25, or I can call the function application function with the square function and 5 and get 25. A dollar sign usually helps clean up grammar by replacing a pair of parentheses. For a simple example of where this can be used, the square of the sum of 2 and 3 is 25. If we erase the parentheses, then that changes the meaning because it squares the 2 and adds that to the 3. If we put a dollar sign between the word square and the numbers, then it means the same thing as the first thing, but with fewer punctuation marks and fewer levels of nesting parentheses. Typically, the dollar sign goes in place of a left parenthesis and removes one right parenthesis at the end of the same line. 
And now it's the section on Map, Filter, and Reduce, some design patterns used to solve many programming tasks in the functional style. Map, Filter, and Reduce do many of the things that for loops and while loops do in imperative programming. For loops, while loops, conditional statements, and subroutines, all these things are in a category called control flow. Control flow just means ways of organizing instructions to the computer, and it exists in imperative programming, but not functional programming. Think of it this way. When you need to solve something with imperative programming, you ask what kind of control flow will solve this, and you put on your control flow goggles and look through your control flow toolbox and see if anything looks like it's the thing to use. When you need to solve something with functional programming, one of the first questions should be, could this be done with map filter and or reduce? And then you put on your map filter reduce goggles and you look in your map filter reduce toolbox and see if anything looks like it's the thing to use. Simplest example of a map, a filter, and a reduce. The sandwich example. We start with W, the list of ingredients. Potatoes, carrots, onions, olives, and peaches. Now I'll show you a map right before defining it. The list X is chopped potatoes, chopped carrots, chopped onions, chopped olives, and chopped peaches, which is just like W but with the word chopped at the start of each thing. And X is defined as X equals map chopped plus plus W, and plus plus is the function for joining strings. So what did map do? It took the list W, and a function which can be done to any of the things in W, namely adding letters to the start of a word, and it applied the function to each element of W to result in X. In general, map takes a function from A to B, and a list of A's, and returns a list of B's. Filter is another function which takes a list and returns a list. It's used to filter out elements based on a comparative test like is greater than or is equal to. Suppose we chopped the carrots by accident and they don't go in the sandwich. We define y as filter is not chopped carrots x, and y is chopped potatoes, chopped onions, chopped olives, and chopped peaches. Pretty simple. The comparative test was seeing if any given item is equal to chopped carrots and filtering out any which are. The output was a list just like the input, but without the chopped carrots. That's map and filter. Reduce is called fold in Haskell, but it's called reduce in other functional programming languages. They're synonyms, and you might see it called either thing in your subsequent adventures. I'll call it fold now instead of reduce. This is the section on map, filter, and fold. Folding is what happens when you take a list and then do something to each thing in the list to get a single thing as a result. For example, if you have a list of numbers and you take the sum of all the numbers, you get a single value. That's a fold. Same thing for taking the product of a list of numbers. Another fold would be taking a list of numbers and finding the smallest value in the list. That's the minimum function. In Haskell, there's fold L and fold R, a distinction we're ignoring for now. So how do we make a single object from our list of chopped and filtered vegetables? By taking a bit of each of the chopped things and combining them. We define Z as the fold L of this function over the list Y, and all this function does is take a bit of each of the things and combine them. Z equals poop because you're as bad at cookery as I am and you've made a sandwich with raw potatoes and peaches in it. Also, poop is what you get when you take the first letter after the word chopped of each of the things on the list Y. Potatoes, onions, olives, peaches. Let's look at some examples from the ray tracer. First, maps. This whole program is built around maps. Maps are the ridge flip, I mean, backbone. Maps are the backbone of this program. The way this program works is that this sort of initial state is born here, and it's very simple, then it goes through a series of six transforms, each one being a map, and it ends up being exactly what we write to the hard drive to be the picture file. In this initial state, we have a list of pairs of numbers, and that list starts with 1, 1, then 2, 1, then 3, 1, and ends with 160 by 90, or whatever are the maximum numbers for the resolution we're using. And it's just the indices for each pixel in terms of the row and column number on the screen. After a series of maps, each one mapping a function to each of the things in the list, the most important map being collision detection, we end up with the exact string that's written to the picture file, which is a long list of triples of numbers plus a bit of stuff at the top. Here's the line of code that gives us the first of those lists, the one that starts with 1, 1 and contains the pairs of indices for all the pixels. If I only want to know the RGB values for the first pixel, there's a series of six functions that I can do to the pair 1, 1, and that will return the RGB values for the top left pixel. But instead of doing those six functions to one of the pixel index pairs to get the color for one pixel, we map those functions one after another to the whole list of pixel index pairs to get the whole list of RGB values for all the pixels. I'm calling these the seven states and the six transforms. The six transforms are the six mapped functions, and the seven states are the states that the list goes through, starting with the list of pairs of pixel indices and ending up as the list of RGB values.
This line of code gives us the first state, the list of pairs of pixel indices. After mapping one function to that list, we get a list of pairs of numbers where each pair represents how far along the virtual screen relative to the center in number of pixels to get to any given pixel on the screen. After mapping another function to that, we get a list where each entry is a triple of numbers representing a 3D vector of how far and in what direction any given pixel is from the center of the screen. After mapping another function to that, we have a list where each entry has a triple of numbers representing where each pixel is in the 3D space relative to the origin. After mapping another function to that, we have a list where each entry is two triples of numbers representing the starting location and direction of the I-beam for that pixel. After mapping another function to that, the biggest one, collision detection, we have a list where each entry is a triple of numbers for RGB values. And after mapping another function to that, we have those values in plain text with PPM image formatting. Let's talk about the maybe type constructor before filters. A maybe can be a nothing or a just. Nothing represents absence of thing. The opposite of a nothing is a just. A just has the word just followed by a something. You can have just a number, or just a string, or just a triple of numbers, etc. It's called a polymorphic type for that reason. The ray tracer program doesn't use the filter function, but it does contain a custom folding function that we call folding function, and we can break it apart into a filter and a fold. Here's the custom folding function from the ray tracer. Let's look ahead at what outputs this folding function gives. If we do folding function over a list of all nothings, then the result is a nothing. If we do folding function on a list which has a bunch of nothings and one just, with the color black and the number 2 million, then the result of folding function is just black and 2 million. If we have a list with a bunch of nothings and a just black and 2 million and a just white and 1 million, and do folding function to that list, we get just white and a million. Here's why we want a function that does that. Recall the eye beams from the workings of the ray tracer. Each pixel is the result of a beam shooting out of the viewer's eyeball through a particular pixel of the screen and towards the plot. When a beam queries a face of a block, a nothing means this beam missed this face of this block, and a just means this beam hit this face of this block at some given distance and found some given color. Folding function returns a nothing when it's given a list of all misses, and returns a just color and distance if it's folding over a list with one or more hits. Each beam queries each block, and each of those queries checks all six faces of the block. That's handled with two layers of folding the same function, one fold over the faces of each block, then a fold of those results covers all the faces of all the blocks of the plot. After two layers of folding, we know whether a beam missed everything, or we know the color and distance of the closest hit. That wording might have been confusing, but the point is that the beam checks each face of each block to determine a hit or a miss, then it does this folding function to compare all those results to find the closest face of the closest block that it hit. This function is defined only in terms of comparing two things, and after we talk about recursion, I'll show you how something like this can be applied to a list of things. But this line says that if it compares two nothings, the result is a nothing. And these two lines say that if it compares a nothing and a something, then the result is that something. And this line says that if it compares two somethings, then see which one has the smaller number for distance and return the distance and color for that one. That should all make sense from how we've seen it working. Now let's break the folding function apart into a filter and a fold, just for the sake of modifying the ray tracer program into a program that uses maps and filters and folds. Here, I've changed the name of the folding function to the long name filter out nothings and return closest, but the program is otherwise identical. And now I've actually replaced the folding function with a filter and a fold. First a filter clears all the nothings, then the folding function is only defined in terms of what it does with pairs of hits. The result of doing that filter and that fold in series is identical to the original folding function. And now, if asterisk, we decide to put this code in place of the original folding function in the program, then it will have maps, a filter, and a fold. Can you see how map, filter, and fold can be used instead of the loops of control flow? When you're going through a list and addressing one thing at a time, in imperative programming you typically make a for loop with a loop index spanning a series of values that matches the span of indices for that list. And then you define a thing to do within the loop, and then that thing is done to all the things in the list when the loop is run. Possibly some kind of mutation, or you could be defining a new list. Map, filter, and reduce can do the same kind of business, but using recursion. How can these things be done with recursion? If you don't know much about recursion, then you probably find it quite scary, and hopefully I can demystify it for you, using knowledge. I used to be scared of recursion too. Let's start with an example from real life, a recursion we're all familiar with because of how useful it is. In school, when the teacher has a stack of papers and wants to get a paper to each student, does he hand one to each student? No, that's why we have the concept of take one, pass it on. 
the teacher hands the stack to one student and says, take one, pass it on, and that guy takes one, passes on the rest of the stack to the next guy, and says the same thing, and this continues until everyone has a paper. The full instruction, if you're being rigorous, would be, take one, pass on the rest, and say all this to the next guy, unless you're the last guy, in which case take this last one. That's a recursive instruction. Each person has the same set of instructions, and when each person does their instructions, then you've effectively done something to all the people. Specifically, this take one, pass it on thing is a recursive implementation of map. There's some simple function which is to give someone a piece of paper, but you have a list of people who don't have papers, and you want to have a list of people who each have papers. That's basically the definition of what map solves. So we can say that we have an implementation of the function map give paper to, and that implementation is the instruction take one, pass on the rest, and say all this to the next guy unless you're the last guy, in which case take this last one. Now maybe recursion is starting to seem less scary, but still mysterious. We continue. There's two types of recursion. There's infinite recursion, which is a lot like an infinite loop, which can keep going forever unless it's interrupted by something outside the program. And there's finite recursion, which is a lot like a finite loop. It starts, does something, ends, and gets some useful result. You know what else has recursion? Human languages. And it has both types. Here's an example of an infinite recursion, which would need to keep going forever in order to be completed. Everything I say is a lie. Except that. And that. And that. And that, and that, and that, and that, and that. The reason why it's infinite is because the recursive part keeps getting called with the same input. Here's an example of a recursive grammar structure which does terminate to make a meaningful sentence because the recursive bit is called with different inputs each time, reaching some base case where the recursion stops getting called. I am your father's brother's nephew's cousin's former roommate. Three types of recursive grammar structure are possessives, subordinate clauses, and prepositional phrases. Some can be interchangeable. Let's diagram prepositional phrases. A prepositional phrase has a preposition and a noun phrase, and that noun phrase can be a noun or it can be a prepositional phrase. If it's just a noun, then the recursion is terminating. If the prepositional phrase has another prepositional phrase in it, then it's calling another level of nesting. Let me summarize a bunch of the stuff I've just said. Recursion is scary and it's hard to understand if the person who is trying to teach it to you isn't really good at teaching. Congratulations again on finding this video. The reason why it's scary is because of self-similar structure. When there's some thing which has parts and those parts have similar structure to the whole thing, that makes you wonder how you can have a recursion which isn't an infinite loop. We continue the explanation. In a finite recursion, there's a general case and a base case. The recursion will go to another level when called with a general case thing, but once it's called with a base case, then it's not called to another level, and then it can start resolving, then the whole nesting resolves into some value and you say, thanks recursion, and you take your newfound knowledge and do whatever's the next thing you need to do. And the difference between a finite recursion and an infinite recursion is the same as the difference between that joke from Spaceballs and that joke from Family Guy. Recursion demystified. It is necessary to make an inquiry as to whether it is necessary to make an inquiry. Let's look at an infinite recursion in the context of programming. Remember infinite data structures? You define a thing which would take an infinitely long time to print, but you don't compute the whole thing. You use another function which takes some finite number of things from the infinite list of things, and if you do that in a programming language that does lazy execution, then you can have working programs that do that, and it's useful. Let's look at an implementation of the repeat function. The repeat function, recall, takes a thing and gives an output that's an infinitely long list of that thing. You can write this very concisely in Haskell using recursion. This is the whole definition, and it says the repeat of something, call it x, is 1x joined to the repeat of x. If you call repeat with the letter f, then it says repeat f is 1f joined to the repeat of f. Then because it's lazy, it says I know the first thing I need to write, it's an f. Then the rest of what I need to write is the repeat of f. Well, what's the repeat of f? Well, that's 1f joined to the repeat of f. Now I know the second character to write, it's an f. Then the rest of what I need to write is the repeat of f. That can go on forever. If you just ask for the repeat of f, then it will keep going until interrupted. If you write take 50 of the repeat of f, then you get 50 f's. So that's how you use a function to take a finite bit from an infinitely big thing, where that infinitely big thing is defined by an infinite recursion, and that infinite recursion is infinite because the function keeps getting called with the same value. A quick note about this before we go to finite recursion. 
This line of code, it looks a lot like that equation x equals x plus 1. Remember, if we see x equals x plus 1 in math class, then we have to say, this equation can't be satisfied for any real value x. Well, infinity isn't a real number, but infinity does equal itself plus 1 or itself plus 2, etc. This is an infinitely long list of things, and it's totally not cheating to say, this thing, which happens to be infinitely big, is equal to itself joined to some finitely big thing. Okay, here's the expansion again of our factorial function. Recall that it said that the factorial of 5 is equal to 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. But there's also all these brackets here. Technically, the multiplication function can only take two inputs. If you write some product like this, this is really shorthand for this, or this, or this, or any version of this that has enough brackets that each multiplication symbol is taking one input, possibly parenthetical on the left, and one on the right. Let's call this the product function instead of multiplication. The product of some number and some number is some number. Now, if you look just at the innermost pair of brackets and ignore everything else, we have the product of 2 and 1. That's the product function taking inputs 2 and 1, and the product of 2 and 1 is 2. Now let's look at the two innermost pairs of brackets and ignore everything else. This expression says the product of 3 and the product of 2 and 1. When we have an expression like this, the outer product is sort of waiting for the inner product to resolve before the outer product can do anything. We say the product of 2 and 1 is 2, replace that expression with a 2. Now what expression do we have? Now this outer product function has 2 inputs and the product of 3 and 2 is 6. And so on, to whatever level of nesting. 5 levels if you're computing the factorial of 5, 50 levels if you're computing the factorial of 50. That's Spaceballs, the repeat one is Family Guy. That's function composition by recursion. Speaking of which, what's this? The square root of 1 over x plus 1 cubed? But if you just say that sequence of words or write those words without any brackets to indicate priority, then the meaning is ambiguous. If I take that series of words and put brackets here, then it means this mathematical expression. With these brackets, it means this. And I think I found at least nine of those. But you can use a different wording, which makes the meaning unambiguous the square root of the inverse of the cube of the successor of x. Ah, that's a lot like our function composition, where we had a product of a product of a product of a product. With a different recursion in the grammar, we can reverse the arguments and call this x's successors cubes inverses square root. Sound familiar? Oh, what if I say it like this? x's successors cubes inverses square root. What's that make us? That makes us related to math and to computers in a profound way that you might not have noticed before today. The recursion in the structure of our grammar syntax, the recursion in the composing of math functions, and the recursion in how computers do math computations when programs are written in the functional style, these are all parallel. And as ludicrous as it sounds, Darth Helmet is the key to understanding all of them. Now let's look at how folding is done recursively. This folding function, it's defined in terms of two inputs. If you call folding function with a list of two inputs, it does this thing to them and gives an output. What if you want to fold over a list of five things? You have the folding function, you have the list of five things, and the computer somehow uses the thing that's defined in terms of two things, does something to the list of five things, and returns one thing. Let's call the folding function ff for short, and let's start looking at the last two things on the list. It's pretty easy to compute the ff of the fourth and the fifth things, because that's only two things, and ff is defined in terms of any two things. Say we do that folding function to the fourth and the fifth things, and get some value, call it ff45. So ff45 is some single value once we compute it, and because that's a single thing, then we can call another instance of folding function with that thing and some other thing. How about the third element from the list? Now we have this expression, the ff of the third and the ff of the fourth and the fifth ff of 4th and 5th resolves into some single value, we do ff with that value and the third value, that resolves to some value, then you can do the ff of that value with the second element, get some value, do the ff of that value with the first element, and hey, you've just folded over the list of five things to get one thing, even though your folding function was defined in terms of any two things. And you can do that with a list of whatever number of things. Like take one pass it on, the instruction always refers to two people at a time, but it can map papers to a row of any number of people. Speaking of which, I'm not going to bother diagramming similarly for map and filter. The section on map, filter, and reduce is now over, and now there's a part when we point to this super cool looking diagram here and say a few things, and then that makes the end of the second act. I decided that a full conceptual explanation of the program is optional homework that you can find in the book for this that you should buy. This diagram, it's a map of the dependencies between functions, and it's also a concept map. It looks like something written by the Tralfamadorians from the movie Arrival, which were, by the way, extra-temporal.
coincidence? Maybe. Rectangles represent functions, arrows show which functions refer to which other functions, and the dots flow along the arrows. Typically you can make a diagram like this for a functional program or a procedural program. Functional programming is more similar to how a brain works, so this job of mapping the dependencies between functions and then having that also be a concept map works a bit better in functional programming. The left side has the seven states and the six mapped functions that I mentioned when talking about map. It looks kind of like a circle, but if you follow the dots through the states, you'll see that it's just a straight sequence. I curved it to make it fit on the screen nicely. Again, the first of those states is the list of pairs of pixel indices defined in a short line of code, and the last state is the output picture in plain text numerals for RGB values. All the other functions are helpers to these steps. In the diagram, each function has a number, and we have all the numbers from 1 to 104. This diagram is not a full expansion. A full expansion would have a separate box for each function, and it would look even more like a plate of spaghetti, and it would be completely pointless. For that matter, you could also throw the prelude functions into that diagram, and it would be even more convoluted and more pointless. If you do the optional homework of grokking the whole program, then this partial expansion is actually useful for understanding the program. Here are some ways the diagram is abbreviated. We have some boxes with multiple functions inside that all have the same dependencies. We have this box of functions that I didn't connect because they're all basic utility stuff. And we have these boxes with the interconnected symbol also to represent where this partial expansion is abbreviated. Those are the things that, if expanded into full detail, would make the diagram too convoluted. We have this thing in a special rectangle here that says here be IO. The one thing which points to it is go command, which is just the name that I used instead of main. Go command is the only function that directly does IO. All other functions are helpers to go command, or helpers of helpers, or helpers of helpers of helpers, etc. That means that all the dependencies in the whole diagram flow to go command. Of course they do. If there were anything on this diagram that weren't helping this, then that would mean it's not part of getting the output, and then it wouldn't belong on the diagram. The section that's largely about IO is very soon. This stuff on the right side does the computation for collision detection. That's the math that takes a beam and a block face and determines whether there's a hit and the color and the distance if there is one. It's the most complicated of the helper functions to the main sequence. The little bit near the middle is folding function. Putting it there makes it possible to separate the left stuff and the right stuff neatly. The line numbers are based on a certain version of this program, another of the morphologies of it. Recall the human readable version of the program and this extreme form with the maximal abstraction? If you start the process of turning the program from this form into this form, but then stop when there's three functions at zero indentation and everything else blocked up on them, and you leave the functions with their original names, then you get the 104 line version of the program, and this diagram is based on that form of the program. The three blocks of code are the left stuff, the right stuff, and the middle stuff on the diagram. One last conceptual thing about this program. There is one line in the human readable version of this program which is highly unreadable. The one that starts with level 4 plot equals. Let's have a look at it. This function gives us the coordinates of all the blocks of a plot, which is the voxelized Sierpinski octahedron, and we can get any level of this fractal pattern by choosing which number to put after the word take. Okay, what's a Sierpinski octahedron? Let's say you have anything, like a cube or a teapot. If you take six of those and arrange them into a formation whereby one is directly above some common center, and one below, and one is to the north, and one is to the south, and one is to the east, and one is to the west, then you can call that one step of this pattern. If you then take that formation of six things, and make six copies of that whole thing in place, and move one in each of the same cardinal directions, then that's another step of the pattern. And you can step to any level of that pattern by repeating the process of, at every step, making six copies and moving them in the six cardinal directions. If you do that with cubes, you get a voxelized Sierpinski octahedron. If you do that with octahedrons, you get a Sierpinski octahedron. But the realist Sierpinski octahedron has unlimited levels. This animation does convey the infinitude by a clever crossfading trick, but the Sierpinski octahedron with infinite levels would be either infinitely big with finitely big pieces, or finitely big with infinitesimally tiny pieces. Or the, the real realist Sierpinski octahedron would be infinitely big and made of infinitesimally tiny pieces. As you might have guessed by the definition, each level of the Sierpinski octahedron has six times as much stuff as the next simpler level and is twice as wide. If each block is a cubic meter, then level one is one block which you would be able to squeeze within the span of your arms, the third level might be able to fit within your house, the eighth level if you buried the bottom half would be almost the same size as the Great Pyramid, 
The 24th level would be wider than the Earth, the 36th level centered at the Sun would reach beyond the orbit of Pluto, the 67th level would be wider than the galaxy, and the 90th level wouldn't be able to fit within the observable universe. If we ask a GHCI for the take one of this function, we get six sets of coordinates. Put a block at each of those six locations and you get level two of the pattern, which is a sort of 3D cross shape. Put two after the word take in the function and get 36 sets of coordinates corresponding to an octahedral formation of 3D crosses. The next level is an octahedral formation of octahedral formations of 3D crosses where a 3D cross is an octahedral formation of individual blocks. Wow, this feels kind of like that recursion stuff. General levels and a base level, anyone? Anyways, let's read the actual line now. This does not read like English. A level 4 plot equals the fold of function composition, the first three of zipping with function application, an infinitely long list of some function of E and A, which is A, monad bind of some function of D and a point, which is six points, one in each of the six cardinal directions D units from the original point, the powers of two, all the counting numbers, the origin. That is highly golfed. In programming, golfing refers to converting a program into the shortest form you can make it with it still giving the right output. This basically translates directly into the machine code instructions for locating the unicorn tiers, bypassing any hope of human readability. I wasn't able to read this line of code intelligibly at any time before, during, or after writing it. Thought function composition was only for putting together the names of two functions? No, you can also pass function composition to something like fold? Thought function application was the do-nothing function which just helps you clean up some parentheses? No, you can also pass the function application function to something like zip with, which is another list traversing things similar to map filter and fold. What the heck is a monad bind? Hmm, maybe that will be in the scope of the sequel to this video which might be posted in hopefully less than five more years. If this line seems scary, fear not. You don't have to learn this wizard stuff in order to keep a job. I just wanted to show you something closer to the skill ceiling. There's a super high skill ceiling for this high art in functional programming where the language bits are made of concept bits. I do also like golfing in imperative where the language bits are made of instruction bits. My three favorite golf courses in order are Haskell, the first course of Mario Golf 64, and TI-83 Basic. Let's look at some of the different renders you can get by tinkering the parameters in the program. This is a render from the first working version of this ray tracer. The color stuff was very simple with each hit returning blue and each miss returning red. This is actually a render into the same 3D model as you can tell by the staircase shape, but all the other details are washed out by everything overlapping with the same color. The renderer outputs a single picture when you run it. In order to make animations, you have to run it several times with a range of values. You could vary some combinations of the user location, the size of the virtual screen, aspect ratio, number of pixels, and the plot. In order to make that work and not take an absurdly long time, you might want help from animation design software. And I made this program for that purpose. This program is a little help with animation in the same way that the whip snake is a little backpack. Let's consider how we can make an animation while still having some sense of atemporality or immutability. An animation is something that takes place over time. How can we make one while still saying that the code doesn't partake of mutation? Let's think of a videotape. You put a videotape into a tape player, and then the tape player reads what's on the tape and displays a series of pictures onto a screen. The tape player is interpreting the tape as a series of things to do over a span of time. But when the tape is sitting there on a shelf, it's just a strip of plastic wound around a pair of spools. The tape isn't doing anything time-based when it's just sitting there on a shelf. Likewise, whatever machine made that tape could interpret that manufacturing process as the process of making a strip of plastic wound around a pair of spools, rather than making something that encapsulates a series of time-bound instructions. In the same way, when I render an animation, the program is just going to locations on the hard drive and writing values for bits, and those can be interpreted as numerals in plain text, or they can be interpreted using a video player as a series of instructions. Totally not cheating. Now that we've resolved that time dimension issue, here's a pair of animations made on a very simple animation program, and now here's another issue that seems to require a time dimension. This frame, for example, looks like we first took a blank canvas, then applied a red stripe to it, then applied a blue stripe over it. The blue stripe appears to overlap the red stripe, as if it was painted on at a later time than the red stripe. And the frames of the other animation appear to be made of first a blue stripe, and then a red stripe over it, or after it. 
The way I generated these frames was to make a function for red stripes and a function for blue stripes. The red stripe function takes any picture and defines a picture that has a red rectangle on part of the canvas and has whatever corresponds to the input on the rest of the canvas. And the blue stripe function does the same for blue. To get this frame with red overlapping blue, I apply the blue stripe function to a blank canvas, then apply the red stripe function to the resultant of that. To get the frame with blue overlapping red, I apply the red stripe function to a blank canvas, then apply the blue stripe function to the resultant of that. In both cases, I compose the two color stripe functions, one with a sequence red then blue, then with a sequence blue then red. But we don't need to think of them as sequences of actions. These functions can be thought of as relating a thing to a thing. This frame bears the blue stripe relation to some canvas where that canvas bears the red stripe relation to a blank canvas. In other words... Totally not cheating. Time for an interlude. There aren't a whole lot of options. He was flying! Boma, he was flying! Boma, he was flying! Boma, is that really how your brain works? He was flying! Boma, he was flying! Boma, he was flying! Boma, is that really how your brain works? All right, the second act is over now. It's the third act. There's two big sections in this third act, and they are the what and the why from the title. Starting with the first of those now, let's finally give a definition of functional programming and let's talk about I.O., which is a big part of that definition. I.O. is short for input and output. Devices that input to your computer are things that sense some conditions of the world. They can be direct sensors, such as a camera or a microphone, things which the user interacts through, such as a keyboard or a mouse, or things which have data that can be loaded in, such as reading from a hard drive or a thumb drive or an internet connection. Output devices are the means for your computer to affect the outside world. These can be things that people sense, things intended for one user, such as a monitor and headphones, or things intended for several people at a time, such as big displays and systems of alarms, or things that hold data that can be written to, such as writing to a hard drive or a thumb drive or an internet connection. We also use the words input and output when talking about functions. For example, when you give the factorial function an input of 5, it gives you an output of 120. If a program takes input from input devices or gives output to output devices, then it's doing I.O. operations. For example, let's say we have a program which asks the user to type in a number, then computes the factorial of it and displays the result to the computer screen. The reading from the keyboard is an input operation, and the writing to the computer screen is an output operation. Let's stick with the word operation to refer to I.O. stuff, and function to refer to stuff we've already been calling functions, which are not directly doing I.O. Hmm. If the definition of functional programming is that everything is functions, and if the definition of function is stuff that isn't doing I.O., then that would mean that every purely functional program, by definition, does nothing detectable in any way. Not very useful. Let's look at our simple factorial program. The part that reads an input from the user and the part that gives an output to a user, those are the I.O. operation parts. The factorial function that's called between the input and the output thing, that function can be written as we've seen before, and that's a purely functional part. Purely functional means it always gives the same outputs for the same inputs. If I have a Haskell program that defines factorial this way, and then I have a equals the factorial of 5, b equals the factorial of 6, and c equals the factorial of 5, then I know that a and c will always be equal because they're both outputs of the same function being given the same input. Now when I'm saying input and output, I'm talking about something more limited. This is part of a program giving another part of the same program some input, and then that program giving some other part of the program the output. Let's get these definitions specific by drawing a box around the program. Anything within a program that's interacting with things inside the same program, functions taking inputs from functions and giving outputs to other functions within the same program, that's purely functional. Any parts of the program that reach outside of the program into the world, either for inputs or outputs or both, those are the I.O. operations. I've been using the careful wording purely functional and the purely functional parts of a program. Let's draw some definitions now. To a first approximation, these four distinctions are all the same. Purity versus impurity, functions versus operations, 
no I.O. versus doing I.O., and same outputs for same inputs versus different outputs for same inputs. So purity, it means functions, it means stuff that stays interacting within a program, and it means parts that always have the same outputs for the same inputs. Impurity, it means I.O. operations, the kind that reach outside the program, and the kind that have no guarantee of giving the same outputs for the same inputs. What do we mean by I.O. operations giving different outputs for the same input? When this program says to read an input from the user's keyboard, I might run this program one day and get a 5 from the user, run it another day and get a 6 from the user, and run it some other time and have the user type in a word instead of a number. Different outputs from the same input just means that when this line runs, what it evaluates to is conditional on things in the world outside of the program. If a program says to read whatever's at the location c slash documents slash input dot txt, and then you run that program, and then you change what's there and run it again, that program is going to read two different things. Output operations are typically less fickle than input operations, but they're still definitely in this category of impure. If I run my ray tracer program, which includes an instruction to write the output file onto my computer, then it typically works, but if the hard drive is full, then the output will be error, there's no room to write this anywhere. And if you send the robot the command to pick up the dry cleaning twice, he might be successful one day and get into a car crash the next day under the same command. Okay, that's these four parallel distinctions covered. A program that's all purely functional can't do anything. I mentioned that the ray tracer program has only one I.O. operation, and that of course it's an output. The rest of the program being purely functional means that all the functions and values it uses are defined in the program and in libraries of pure functions. That program is like 99% purely functional, but with just one thing that's impure I.O. type stuff. In the human readable version of the program, the one with type declarations, this line is the only one with a type that says I.O. If I needed to write a program that takes inputs from the hard drive and the keyboard and the internet, and then output to the screen and the speakers and the hard drive, then I would need at least six I.O. operations and as many lines in the code that call on I.O. types. And those lines in the program would need to be sequential. So what's the point of all this? In order to make a functional program do anything, you have to turn it into an imperative program. All is for naught, nobody ever wrote a functional program that solved even the simplest problem, and any functional program that was modified to do anything was made into an imperative program. Actually, all that stuff is true except for when I said all's for naught. It's time to introduce a concept called the densely packed Hitler's theorem. It's a theorem of epistemology, but it applies quite excellently here to explain this computer science thing. The densely packed Hitler's theorem says that if you're practicing a serious amount of doubt, you technically can't ever have true knowledge that it's not the case that everywhere that's not in your field of vision right now is full of densely packed Hitler's. Returning to computers, by defining the difference between function and operation and categorizing the parts of your code accordingly, you get to separate the pure and the impure very neatly. You make two little boxes in your imagination and you say, these are all the purely functional parts and these are all the impure I.O. parts, and every little bit of code goes in one of the two boxes. Those boxes, they encompass and they eclipse, because now you can actually say, this box labeled functional, once I confirm that everything in there is working, I actually can turn my back to it and count on it being less likely to turn into trouble. And if this program ever does glitch, I know the trouble is more likely to be in that box labeled impure. So don't worry, you can still give the robot the commands to pick up the dry cleaning and make dessert. You just have to recognize that those are operations and put them in the appropriate section of your otherwise functional code. If you're writing in a functional language and you're making something that needs to have a lot of different I.O. operations, then the program is going to have a long sequence in that I.O. part, and that part is going to look a lot like a procedural program. At that point, the main difference between that program and one that's just written in a procedural language is mostly going to be the way the subroutines or functions work. In a procedural language, the subroutines are written in terms of instructions, and in functional, the functions are written in terms of relations. That still keeps separated the main sequence of operations from the purely functional parts, and it can be worth it to do that and choose a functional language over a procedural one. What does all this do to our definition that in functional programming everything is functions kind of? Well, the truth is that in functional programming you make as many things as possible functions, but not everything. That qualifies the statement and gets rid of the kind of, but it's kind of disenchanting. Yeah, that's all we're doing here with the whole paradigm, really. Functional programming is all about putting as much of the job as possible into the purely functional box, and is just basically being imperative for the rest. But even though that's all we're doing, it still does require deprogramming a lot of the for loop module in your brain and figuring out how to make recursions, and all that stuff about limitations causing advantages is true. All the selling points are still true. My point is that the job of a functional programmer can be literally described as this is the guy who knows how to make as many things as possible functions, but there are subtle implications of what that means practically.
Here's a program that does factorial using a for loop in Haskell. It uses the same ideas as the factorial subroutine we had for MATLAB with the for loop and the indices and the accumulator. It imports the state monad and uses the things from it, which is another way of delineating the impure parts of code. Since a factorial function can be made without impurity, this is an example of one of the hacky ways you can use for loops but shouldn't. In this example, the value of accumulator is understood to have different values at different times. That means that this program partakes of mutation, which is something that never happens in the pure parts of a program. Adhering to the functional style simply means refraining from doing things like this whenever it's possible. About operations needing to be in a sequence, functions don't. The majority of a functional program is a list of definitions of functions, and it doesn't have to be in any particular order. Immutability gives us atemporality, and this list of functions isn't a sequence of anything. In the human-readable version of the ray tracer program, I tried to group things together like putting together a bunch of utility functions and putting the main sequence of lists and maps together, but these can be in any order. This is the same program, but with the lines alphabetized. And this alphabetized one does run, and it makes the same output picture. That is rather unusual. Try alphabetizing the lines of a program written in any other language and see if it still runs. Alright, that's the end of the section about I.O. and the what of functional programming. We're fighting the war of attrition with a BOOMER! We're fighting the BOOMER! <laughs> And with that, we begin the last and the biggest section on the advantages and disadvantages of functional programming, plus supporting arguments. A quick preview of this section. First, the most important idea relating to advantages and disadvantages. As I said in the introduction, I am not a functional programming supremacist, and functional programming is the best thing for some but not all programming tasks. And there's some discussion of that. Next, there's some discussion on hardware, the state of the industry, the future, and functional programming's role in the bigger picture. Then some discussion of the advantages of functional programming. Then some discussion of some aspects that are sort of mixed advantage -y slash disadvantage -y things. Then some discussion on the disadvantages of functional programming. There's a few other things there. Then the lecture closes with some discussion of recommended readings and other resources. But please do watch through the postscript as well. Okay, functional programming. Best for some things, not the best for all the things. Let's all take off our blinkers for a second. Programming. It's a very wide field of work, and everyone is familiar with different sectors of the industry. Let's take a couple of extreme examples and see how procedural programming can be the best tool by a big margin for some things, and how functional programming can be the best tool by a big margin for other things. Imperative programming is written in terms of instructions for bit-flipping operations. If you're doing the kind of programming task whereby you're designing a program to run as quickly as possible, more often than not that means imperative programming. Heraclitus was right, every computer is on fire, and change is the spirit of the processor. Imperative programming is closer to machine level than functional programming is. Functional programming is closer to human brain level than imperative programming is. Thus, if you're doing the kind of programming task whereby the speed of the program doesn't really matter, but the amount of time taken to write the program does matter, functional programming can often be the best choice. For imperative programming, let's consider Counter-Strike, a first-person shooter video game. A lot of what that program does is like the ray tracer, simulating a view into a virtual space, but with way more optimizations than the ray tracer from earlier. How many times has the program Counter-Strike said, I want to know the color of this pixel so I will call the rendering routine? Using the newest Counter-Strike, CSGO, as an example, a decent computer screen has 2 million pixels, a decent frame rate is several dozen frames per second, and there's been an average of about 300,000 people playing at any given time for the last three years. The number of times that a screen pixel has been rendered with the programming of Counter-Strike? I'm getting something like 10 to the power of 21, which for comparison, is roughly the number of times of the width of a human hair in the distance from here to Alpha Centauri. That's the kind of subroutine you want optimized to maximize the speed that it's computed when the program's running. For something like that, the design process starts with the boss saying, we need to make a thing that will crunch those numbers as fast as possible once it's built. Then a big investment of programming work goes into making that kind of thing. Our opposite extreme example? Let's say there's some industrial process, and let's say there's a few kilobytes of data that's been gathered by some sensors, and they need someone to write a computer program that crunches the data into information like graphs and bar charts for some humans to understand, but that number crunching requires using an algorithm to do calculus and other conceptual stuff.
Suppose further that if you write this program in a way that's optimized for runtime performance, you can get it down to 10 minutes, but if you write the program as quickly as possible in a functional language, the program will take 40 minutes to run. Continuing to suppose things, let's say it will take 5 hours to write the program in a procedural language, but only 2 hours in a functional language. And let's say that your job is to go to a different facility each day and write a different program each time to crunch a different set of data into a different set of information. Functional programming will double your job performance in the case of those given numbers. And somewhere in between the Counter-Strike example and the Science Facility Consultant example is the rest of the computer programming job market. The main trade-off in this pair of examples is runtime performance versus saving time programming. That's often the case when considering which toolbox to use, but there are many caveats. There are some tasks for which it is easier to optimize program performance with functional programming. There are some tasks for which procedural programming is the easier paradigm to write in. This main trade-off thing is really the main trade-off between high and low level programming languages. Functional programming languages are typically higher level, meaning closer to how a mind works, and imperative languages are typically lower level, meaning closer to how the hardware is working. Haskell and MATLAB are both high-level languages. Both, for example, have abstractions that prevent the need for many for loops, maps in Haskell and the colon operator in MATLAB. And both have the trade-offs typical of high-level languages, even though MATLAB is imperative. C, for example, although technically a high-level language, isn't high-level compared to most languages. The main trade-off between runtime performance and saving time programming would be pronounced when comparing Haskell, a high-level functional language, with C, a relatively lower-level imperative language. Next topic. Hardware and the state of the computer's industry and the future and functional programming's role in the bigger picture. Let's talk about Moore's Law and its many corollaries for home computers from right now, 10 years ago, 20, and 30 years ago. FLOPS is short for floating point operations per second, and it's a unit of measure for how much computing a computer can do per unit time. Moore's Law is actually a very specific thing, and the name is abused frequently by people referring to slightly different things. But to abuse instead the word corollary, let's just say we're looking at computer performance over the last 30 years in terms of computing power measured in flops for a home computer that you can get for half a month's wages. That Moore's Law corollary has also been increasing exponentially. Comparing the computers from 20 and 30 years ago, the relatively newer one is much more powerful, largely because the clock speed is much faster. Comparing the computers from now and from 10 years ago, they both have roughly the same clock speed, but the newer one is much more powerful because it has much more RAM and multiple processor cores. That was also very simplified, but the point is one of the most important things to understand in the history and future forecasts of high technology. Clock speed improvements hit the limit of engineering a while ago, but computing power per dollar is still improving because we're still jamming progressively more transistors into each box. The number of transistors that can be jammed into a chip of a given size is projected to hit the limits of engineering soon, but we can still jam more such chips into each computer for a while after that. How does functional programming fit into all that? Well, the theories of functional programming date back to 4th century BC. Uh, no, that's the ethos, not the theories. But the theories of functional programming date back like a century. This stuff is based partially on the work of theoreticians who were writing between the times of the Jacquard Loom and the ENIAC. If we just look at the part of history when computer programming has been an appreciable size of the whole market of jobs, we're looking at from now to a little more than a half century back. For most of that part of history, functional programming has been a rather obscure thing, making up a small portion of the computer programming job market. That's changing. Now. Functional programming is already a substantial portion of the programming that's being done today. Why did functional programming rise from obscurity? One reason is because optimizing performance is less often necessary with progressively more powerful computers. There's some great history of things like how they got the SNES to run Star Fox, and now your home computer can run an emulator of the same while doing a screen recording with live voiceover and streaming, with still most of its computing power to spare. Apply the same trend to the set of all things computers need to do right now, and the powers of the computers that are doing those things. Often the computing power is overkill even when the program is not even close to being optimized for performance. That decreased need for performance optimizations means we can make the trade-off and use the kind of programming that's more intuitive. Another part of the reason is because computers are using multiple processor cores now, and that separation of pure and impure helps people make programs that know how to split the work into separate chunks for separate cores. That explanation was rather truncated. Look up functional programming and multithreading if you want to continue that line of investigation. But according to some forecasts, it will soon be the case that functional programs are simply better for runtime performance.
If this clock speed and transistor stuff continues, then possibly functional programming becomes both faster to do and faster to run, and there won't even be that trade-off thing anymore because functional programming will be winning on all those fronts. It's very difficult to argue whether the forecast is right or wrong. For all I know, it might be the case that we're all specializing in programming languages for quantum computers five years from now, or some other thing might make functional programming irrelevant. But now you know the arguments for functional programming being useful right now, and the arguments for functional programming being possible possibly more useful in the near future, and you can place your poker chips according to the areas of skill development you think are best. Okay, that's some stuff about the trends in the industry. How is functional programming fitting into the education system right now? Some people will learn functional programming in school, and some won't. Some universities actually teach functional programming as a first language and then teach the bulk of computer science topics in that context. Many universities don't teach any functional programming in any of undergrad or even in a master's degree program in software engineering. Many people argue that too many universities are neglecting it that way. It is however becoming typical to find a one-course coverage of functional programming sometime in a four-year degree program. This lecture is basically a first lecture of a first functional programming course. Oh right, but uh, way better because most professors are awful. And my opinion is that everyone should learn this lecture, except maybe people who don't know English. Unless this has been translated, in which case, yeah, it's just everyone. I think a first functional programming course should be a first year course. I think the topic is at least that important, but I don't think it should be given any kind of exclusive precedence. I'm one of many people who believe that functional and procedural paradigms should both be introduced in first year. Let's not discount that procedural is still bigger in industry. And for education, the most amenable paradigm in which to explain a given concept is in many cases this and in many cases that. In addition to learning about functional programming from one lecture, if you actually practice the things and give this subject a 100 hour level learning effort and achieve some level of get good, you will have wrestled your brain into shapes that it's never taken before and that will give you the brain plasticity to take on any learning task. Some people also find that fun. Okay, that was the bigger picture stuff fitting the topic into the context of the future and the education systems. Time, finally, for discussion of specific advantages and disadvantages. In this lecture, I have drawn the path of logic explaining how the constraints of functional programming lead to the advantages almost every time. There might have been one or two times when I just used underpants gnomes logic instead. For example, I mentioned earlier that functional programming often has the advantage of expressivity, but I didn't really explain why it has it. I'm about to do that real soon, but if you're feeling like you have a particular interest in how the constraints can lead to advantages, then you might want to study the theory and design of programming languages. It's a whole field of study with books covering these and other such concepts and their consequences. Okay, discussion of advantages for a while. It's generally easier to test functional programs. Why? The I.O. stuff and the purely functional stuff are separated. Purely functional parts are easier to test, and I.O. parts are harder to test. When the separation is clear, you know, when testing programs, where to direct more effort, and where less effort will suffice, compared to imperative programming, where the state-changing parts and the purely functional parts are tangled together. Having this better modularity also makes for cleaner code, which makes it easier to reason about programs. Think about tinkering with an imperative subroutine. It's awful. Uh, do I have to change this thing here? Well, it's in this list of mutations after this thing's done affecting it, but before this thing started affecting this thing, and your short-term memory is already full. You continue your daily habit of reappropriating more and more of your brain parts into short-term memory, and now there's almost no brain parts left to use as processors. Because functions are atemporal, you don't have to do the same awful thing to your brain, there's less cognitive load for short-term memory, and that leaves way more brain parts left for actually figuring out what you need to change in the program. And it leaves more brain parts left for everything else, like enjoying the world, if that's a thing you like doing. You go home after a day of work and you find yourself saying, wow, I actually didn't spend all day fisting my short-term memory anatomy and doing other inhumane things to myself. I actually can be in the mind state to enjoy a cigar and a drink and maybe throw a movie on. For the most difficult among the functions you'll have to deal with, that thing where you make a map of the dependencies between functions and then that's also automatically a concept map that helps you understand the thing, that can be done on the scale of any part of your functional program. Often that's not an option for mapping the variables of an imperative subroutine. You might draw lines connecting all related variables, and then you might have a spaghetti of, oh, at one time this is equal to this, but at another time it's equal to the square root of that minus half of that, and the diagram does not become a concept map. For a functional program, the map of dependencies between functions will always have a hierarchical structure of lines, and the lines will all have relatively clean definitions. 
Immutability is by design a property of functional programming. From that, there's the emergent property called referential transparency, which means that you won't have two different values for a thing. And from that, there's the emergent properties of expressivity and the guaranteed concept mapping of this kind. Next advantage, roughing in the details, so to speak. Think of a sculpture. Maybe you start with cutting a prismatic shape with the cross-section of an outline as seen from one view, then you scratch details into the surface, then you dig those features in progressively until everything's final shape. With a program, you might make a proto-version with dummy functions that don't even work, then make an early version with functions that do work, then make a later version with improved functions that perform better. That's of course true of both paradigms, but with a better modularity of functional programming, it takes less restructuring to make the progression. Next advantage. Functional languages are more compatible with the idea of passing functions to functions. In a typical procedural language, you pass values to subroutines and get values back. There is some compatibility with passing functions to functions in some procedural languages, but more with functional languages. Suppose you're working on turning Minecraft into a 3D graphing calculator, and you make a program that plots this in Minecraft. It's the 3D scalar field, the flux curves, and the equipotential surfaces for a dipole in 3D. Now suppose you want to make a generalized subroutine whereby you give it any 3D scalar field function, and it plots the three things, but that means passing a function to a function. There are many languages such that once you have that starter program, the best you can upgrade it to without changing languages is a program whereby you have to write a bunch of custom code for each plot. Whereas in a language that supports passing functions to functions, you'll be able to upgrade it to a program that can make new graphs with efficiency as quickly as you can write different functions to give it. Like a graphing calculator, but 3D. I made this graph using MATLAB, which does have good support for passing functions to functions, but I still got the sense that I was in the wrong language, and I heard about this Haskell language that mathematicians like, and I started to suspect that it might be the best language for programming the brains of a graphing calculator. Then I got distracted and did a bunch of other stuff for like five years. Are you sure it wasn't nothing? Oh yeah. But I never scratched it off all of my to-do lists. Mathematicians like to say things like, if there were a universe such that every time you take one step to the north and one step to the west, you end up one step to the north and two steps to the west relative to where you started, what would physics be like? In Haskell, if you ask for the value of 2 plus 2, you get 4, but then you can say, let 2 plus 2 equal 5, and ask for the value of 2 plus 2, and it's 5. Another advantage of high-level languages is that they can be useful for prototyping. This is like making pseudocode and flowcharts as part of a plan. You can't run pseudocode or flowcharts on a computer, but you can make them much faster than you can make programs. If writing a program in Haskell is only a bit more work than writing pseudocode, then it's a little more investment of time, but then you have a program that runs and you can get all the confirmation of a work-alike prototype. When I was making the thousand line animation software, I found that just writing code was more efficient than making a detailed plan first. It was a bottom-up build of 3D animation software from scratch. The code was so lightweight that every time I added a feature that required another data type in the system, I just re-architected all that stuff on the fly. There are many different approaches to prototyping and many types of computer programs and many software prototyping tools, so this idea completely doesn't apply in most examples, but sometimes it does, and I'll close the discussion with prototyping with a quote from Rohit Grover. It takes me less time to write in Haskell plus C++ than it takes me to write in C++. So it's like carpenters. Carpenters measure twice and cut once, that's what I do. And the last advantage before starting the next closely related list, if you have a compulsive personality, functional programming can give you a diverse suite of compulsion satisfactions that the other kinds can't. If you don't, that's fine, it's also useful, but if you do... I suffer from a compulsive disorder called Virtual Tourette Syndrome, which has as its main symptom an abundance of character vocalizations when playing video games that have those. I really don't have a compulsive personality, but if any kind of neatness gives you any amount of satisfaction, then there's probably some fun here for you. There's the separation of the pure and the impure. A place for everything and everything in its place. There's that thing with the function dependency map always being hierarchical and also being a concept map. There's all the extreme morphologies that you can transform a program into, like the one where everything's in the global namespace with the type declaration, the one where all the functions are as simple as possible with the maximum non-redundant level of aware block nesting, there's golfing a whole program, and others of those. <laughs>
Speaking of type declarations, there's also type strictness. In a loosely typed language, you can add a number to a letter because numbers and letters are both really bits with given values at given addresses, and what you can do to one you can do to the other, assuming you can still read the value in whichever way you're interpreting it, and that gives you cool hacky ways of optimizing performance. Haskell is very type strict, and that's typical of functional languages, and that will prevent you from doing things like adding numbers to letters, and that keeps people writing expressively in ways that make sense, prevent errors, and also satisfy that compulsion for neatness. Another satisfying thing about functional programming is all those symbols that help you clean up the grammar. We saw the dots and the dollar signs. Ones we didn't cover include the lambda, the at sign, the underscore, the words let and in, monad stuff, and many others. In addition to enabling a satisfying neatness, these also help people write expressively and efficiently. Now it's time for the things that are sort of combined advantage slash disadvantage things. Let's recall when I showed the two versions of factorial, and I said that you can do this in either of two ways with procedural programming, but only one of the ways in functional programming. Well, for some of the functional programming techniques, you can do functional style things in ordinary procedural languages, like doing factorial recursively. You can also reason in terms of map, filter, and reduce in the procedural languages that support passing functions to functions. Conversely, you can do imperative style things in most functional languages, like when we used a for loop in the impure part of a Haskell program. Many people strongly believe that the best functional programming is done in imperative languages, and that functional languages aren't useful. And many people believe that functional languages are indeed the best way of doing all this. In any case, we've learned some functional style things that can be used in almost any language. Next thing in the list of mixed. The whole connection of constraints leading to advantages. At first it's unpleasant to learn to work within the constraints, then later it becomes natural and the good way becomes the pleasant way. This is like a coach who says, don't do it the bad way, and you say, but I just feel like doing it the bad way, and the coach says, do it the other way anyways, even if you don't feel like it right now, you'll thank me later, and then sometime later the good way becomes the natural way, and you say, oh thanks, it took some time, but that constraint did lead to that advantage. Call it a disadvantage if you want that learning functional programming takes an investment of effort. After the investment, this aspect is all advantage. Assuming your first language is imperative, the early part of learning functional programming will be characterized with the painful conundrum of, I want to use a loop for this, but there are no loops. How can I do this thing using the things that aren't loops? Once you've learned the brain processes for functional programming, you stop thinking, how can I do this thing using the things that aren't loops, and you simply stop thinking of loops as a thing that can get stuff done, because that's when it feels natural to get the things done with the things that aren't loops. That's when you know you've wrestled your brain into the requisite shapes for being able to appreciate the functional programming paradigm. And if you've heard the expression, don't knock it till you've tried it, You've only really tried it once you've legitimately solved some tricky problem using a recursion. But if you can count yourself among the people who have done that, and you still want to write a negative review of the functional programming paradigm, then do make it useful, post it on your blog, and I might link to it in the description section. If you can speak to the caveats better than I can, then I'll link to you for the sake of balance. I don't own any stocks in functional programming. And I'm not even a computers expert, I just play one on TV. Insightful negative reviews of the functional programming paradigm and of this lecture are all welcome. I digress. The next thing in this list is another time-dependent thing. Historically, functional programming has been an obscure job, but is becoming an appreciable portion of the job market for programming. Assuming we live in either the present or the future relative to when I'm saying this, this one's all actually advantage too. And the last thing in the list of advantage slash disadvantage things is debugging. Usually it's easier, sometimes it's harder. The better modularity of functional programming makes it easier to find glitches, but about type checkers and debugging. A loosely typed language has no type enforcement because part of the design of those languages is letting people do weird hacky things for performance optimizing. Functional languages, because they're typically higher level, typically have stricter type checkers. Haskell's type checker is very strict. It won't even let you write a plus b if a is an integer and b is a float. You'll have to put the word from integer in front of a. In a language like this, the type checker is going to find most glitches before even agreeing to run a program. But there's another side to this. If you make a glitch that can't be caught with a type checker, you might be in a tough situation. The type checker is strict because it's trying to minimize how often you find yourself with a type safe glitch. An example. Someone tried to help me with the ray tracer by changing the program to use a completely different data structure to give better performance. He wrote about a hundred lines of code without even leaving the text editor, then he put it through the type checker and it found many type errors. For each one of those, the type checker was helpful enough in indicating the problem that he was able to remove the errors efficiently. 
Then when there were no bugs left for the type checker to catch and we thought we had a program that would render the same image, the program made this picture, which is an entirely different genre of art. When you have a program that's acting completely broken and the type checker can't help, then debugging can be tricky. That's when you use a debugger with steps and breakpoints, and it might be just as helpful as in a procedural language in helping you find the problem, but it might not. I'll mention why that is right after the topic of the disadvantages of functional programming. The most obvious disadvantage of functional programming, anything where functional programming isn't the best tool. Like in the Counter-Strike example, when the design starts with the boss saying, we're going to need to end up with a program that runs as fast as possible, even if that means throwing a lot of work at making it that way, typically functional programming is not a tool among the most useful options. Can you even call that a disadvantage? I'm just saying it can't do everything. That's like saying bicycles have the disadvantage of not being able to convert bread into toast, but I already have a toaster for that. If you want to build a first-person shooter on the ray tracer from earlier but without adding any performance optimizations, the frame rate might be one frame per hour rather than the dozens of frames per second you need for a good game. Assuming you choose the right tool for whatever job, of course, sometimes you do want to improve the performance of a program. That can be difficult with functional programming. That's because the sequence of computing might not be intuitive. Consider, for example, the ray tracer again. We think of the first state being a list of pixel index pairs, starting with 1, 1, then 2, 1, then 3, 1, etc., up to 1280 by 720 if that's the resolution we choose. Then we think of mapping a few functions and that turning the list into a list of pixel locations as x, y, z coordinates. Then we think of mapping another function to that and getting us a list of I-beams in terms of their orientation numbers. Then we think of mapping the collision detection to that and getting a list of pixel colors. When the computer runs the program, that's not what happens. Remember lazy evaluation? When we run this program, the main line says that we need to write some text to a file, and then the program asks only, what's the first character to write? And once it gets that answer, then it asks, what's the next character to write? And it continues that way until it's written all it needs to write. That means that after it's done writing the few characters in the header, it's actually doing the computation for the first pixel, completing that computation to the point that it's writing RGB values, then dumping some memory, then doing the computation for the second pixel, completing that to the point of writing the RGB values for the second pixel, etc. It's not actually doing the first state for all the pixels, then doing the second state for all the pixels and proceeding like that. There is a huge disparity between how we think the program is working and how it's actually working. Procedural programming doesn't have the same kind of concern to the same degree. In procedural, it's typically reasonably clear when a variable is being invoked, what operations affect it, and when some memory can be dumped because of getting some result. Because of this problem of functional programming, it can be very hard to reason about performance, and thus it can be very hard to make performance improvements. In this ray tracer, how can I even know when something is allocated in memory and when it's dumped? Ideally, this program would compute the coordinates of all the blocks of the plot and then keep that data in memory from one pixel's computation to the next. If it's actually recomputing all the block coordinates every time it considers a new pixel, then that's a lot of wasted effort computing the same thing a million times instead of once. I don't even know if that's what's happening when I run this. Honestly, I don't even know how to find out whether it's computing plot once or a million times. Conversely, I don't know if it's dumping memory optimally. When it finishes computing the first pixel, it can dump the memory of all the pixels' XYZ coordinates and the I-beam definition numbers and everything from all the states of that pixels, assuming the RGB values have been written to the hard drive before moving on to the next pixel. And then it can dump that temporary data for the second pixel when it's ready to start on the third one. If it's never dumping any of that stuff, then it's making a very inefficient use of memory. Is it actually dumping when it should be, or is it holding on to a ton of redundant stuff by the time it's done? I don't know. At this time, it might seem that I've made some contradictory statements. Did I just say that functional programming is harder to understand right after saying functional programming is easier to understand? Well, from what we know now, let us say that functional programming is easier to understand in terms of what you have to write in order to make a program that does the right thing. Then once you have such a program, if you then want to understand it on the computer's terms, I mean in terms of what algorithm it's mechanically going to employ, prepare for trouble when you need to understand a program on those terms. But if you have a program made of code that makes sense to you, and the computer is doing with that code something that's other to how you understand the code, but if you never have to address that other, then you're fine and using the functional paradigm ideally made the whole thing easier for you.
There's just a weird disparity between how you understand the code and what the computer's doing with it. Functional code looks to a human like a list of definitions. Functional code, of course, still gets turned into a series of instructions for manipulations. It's instructions to the computer made to look to us like definitions. Consider not using functional programming in situations where understanding that disparity of a given program would be necessary. That's by far the biggest disadvantage of functional programming. A programming job, it starts with asking, which is more important, having a program with optimized performance or having an economy of labor in making the program? Again, that's very simplified, but generally that's the trade-off. If the truth is that you need some balance of those things, but the balance is still in favor of choosing functional programming, the optimizing side of that can be tricky. Returning briefly to the topic of debugging, the first line of defense is all that expressivity and modularity and purity stuff. By design, they help prevent bugs before they happen. Then there's the strict type checker, which prevents bugs while they're happening. And then there's debugging for any bugs that remain in a program that runs. And I'm going to truncate another explanation here by saying that sometimes it'll be hard to find the bug even with a debugger. In short, functional programs are easier to understand and harder to understand, and that's why functional programs are easier to debug and harder to debug. And there's no particular way of avoiding the dreaded type safe glitch. Everyone makes bugs on a first attempt at writing a program, and if you roll bad enough dice on one of those, then you get a glitch that the type checker can't help you with. It's just the law of averages. With an infinite number of monkeys on an infinite number of typewriters, some of them will write a working implementation of bogo sort as the first thing. For any given bug, odds are likely that it's something the type checker can help you with and that makes for efficient bug fixing, but there's a small chance every time that you get a type safe glitch and possibly have an inefficient bug catching job to follow. I encountered at least five type safe glitches in making the ray tracer, and I left most of them in just for fun. Did you notice a potential problem with the folding function from before? If there's a block directly behind your head, an I-beam will detect a hit with a negative distance, and that will put it in front of everything that's actually in front of you. Here's another example of the computing being counterintuitive because of lazy evaluation. What happens when I ask GHCI for the take 89 of our wizardry function? That means we're asking for all the coordinates for all the blocks of a voxelized Sierpinski octahedron wider than the observable universe. Does it have to compute all the levels up to 89 before figuring out the values for level 90? No, it just starts drawing the pattern 60 billion light years due east of here using some lazy evaluation magic, which again illustrates the disparity between how we understand the thing working and how it actually works. It's even too lazy to care that the computer will be a pile of rust long before it finishes any substantial portion of that computation. And that wraps up the discussion of advantages and disadvantages of functional programming, and sadly, that brings us to concluding remarks. This has been a two-hour talk, but despite the length of this lecture, it was a very concise, rapid-fire, no-waffling transmission of ideas optimized for maximum flow rate. There was the main story arc of the what and the why, and there was a lot of meandering necessary to give you a tour of the field of study, and I strongly felt it necessary to not split any of that. So I bundled up all that stuff and made it good enough to make you say, fuck it, I'm watching a two-hour lecture on YouTube today, followed by, oh, that actually was good enough that I'm going to tell all my friends to watch it too. Some recommended readings and other resources for people who want to continue learning functional programming. Definitely watch this lecture more than once, maybe the second time a week after your first viewing. There's a book called Learn You a Haskell for Great Good. It's a great first course on Haskell and functional programming. That book has an interesting publishing deal whereby you can find the book online for free legally, and there's only one or two chapters that aren't in the online version. You only have to pay for the book if you want a paper version and the last 10% of the book. Like this lecture, it's designed to make sense to people with minimal background. Buy the book of this lecture because the book format is better for skimming, refreshing, indexing, highlighting, and supporting your favorite video maker with money. That book and a link in the description should also contain the optional homework of getting a more complete understanding of how the ray tracer program works. That's a sort of random thing for practice. Don't do that optional homework if it sounds awful. Make up some homework, learn a functional language, write a program, tinker with it, read a program someone else wrote, translate a program from some other language into Haskell, or whatever else you can think of. Search Google or some computer-related question-answer forums when you have specific questions. There's also live chats, sometimes containing people who like helping people who come in with questions. There's other books, do a Google search for functional programming learning resources or something. If you have a very light background, you might not be able to find a combination of resources to make the field of study entirely penetrable. If you want that fixed, give me money. <laughs>
Thus ends the lecture. Do watch the postscript, it's like 2% of the length of the lecture. Stay tuned until the video actually terminates because those curtains are coming back up after they come down. What's up everybody, it is the postscript. My name again is Junichiro Swanson. And this is my first published full length lecture, yeah! And this is the inaugural post on this new YouTube channel. Junichiro Megasystems is the name of my business. J Megasystems for short is the name of the YouTube channel. This is when I ask you to give me crowdfunding money. It took me a thousand hours of work to make this on a budget of no money. I've done my homework, now I want to have a crowdfunded business. I'll make sure to get work done more efficiently than a thousand hours of work per a hundred minutes of video. The business model, we make things that are free, you pay us retroactively based on how much you like them. I start hiring as soon as I can afford to pay one person a wage for half a month. I have plans for what to do as a four-person business, I have plans for what to do as a 40-person business. I have many ideas for how to make better educations, and I already have exactly as many Ferraris as I want, which is zero. All the money you send through crowdfunding is money I'll spend on making more free things. Buy production memorabilia on eBay, like the only copies of the original script I was reading from, the papers for the words on screen, and progressive old versions of the script showing how it grew from two pages of point form notes to this. Subscribe to give me money on Patreon and GoFundMe, subscribe to this YouTube channel, there's another YouTube channel, Frungy King, which was my main but now it's my secondary, check the video description for other things, and post this on those uppy downy votey link sherry sub forum things, tell your friends and followers on the social medias, text message emails, fax machines, telegraphs, or just Paul Revere style if you feel like it. Alright, remember, give me as much money as you possibly can. I'm talking $10,000 if you have an average North American income, $10 million if you're actually rich, but every contribution of $10 counts. Consider going to everyone you know and saying, hey, there's a thing you should do, and that's giving money to Janichiro Mega Systems, or some similar thing, maybe your favorite online chat room or video game. Inform people, hey, there's a thing you should do, and that's giving money to Janichiro Mega Systems. Please help! Go, go, Junie Chiro.